Steve with Real Progressives and with me is uh, Pavlina Cherneva, who is a wonderful economist and a personal hero of mine. Hi, how are Hi, you? Good to talk to you. Hi. So do me a favor. I know that your favorite subject is the job guarantee, and I follow you very, very closely on this, but I'd like to hear in your own words, tell me a little bit about the federal job guarantee or the employer of last resort. All right. So the federal job guarantee is a program that you put in place that quite simply gives people jobs. It's called guarantee because it's more like a employment insurance. You know, if somebody for some reason cannot find employment in the private sector, in the public sector, they've tried, they've tried, they've run out of unemployment insurance, what do you do? And there are quite a lot of people who've already exhausted the unemployment insurance now outside of the labor force, so they have pretty difficult existence. So the job guarantee is a safety net. It kind of captures those people and says, hey, um, we've got a ton of things we got to do in the communities, in the green economy. Um, would you like to work at a base wage um, for the public purpose, if you will? And so the job guarantee is that, that assurance, that promise that we, you, you won't be left behind. There will always be something useful and productive for you to do, um, perhaps in the public sector. And as the and, and that in and of itself becomes a stimulus to communities. You know, it helps people themselves helps the economy too, so you don't have these jobless growth kind of episodes. So when the economy does truly recover and generates jobs that are more appealing, better paying, etc., then people have already gotten some skills, some on-the-job experience, maybe apprenticeship you know, uh, experience, and then they can transition out of the program. So the, the job guarantee is, is really that safety net, a transitional program, um, unemployment insurance. So would you say that it would set the minimum wage? Would it be a minimum wage setter, a benefit setter, so that the private sector has to benchmark against the ELR, or is yes. that not the intention here? Um, it is one of the features uh, that are very important of this, this policy. Today everybody talks about the fight for 15, I'm fully supportive, I know there are living wage ordinances across the country, all great. But when you don't have a job, you don't benefit from a living wage ordinance, right? You don't benefit from $15 an hour. So what um, the job guarantee does is it basically creates jobs for all who want to work. So it is, you know, it's a voluntary program, but it, it quite literally provides full employment the way we define it, right? And when you do that, it becomes the de facto uh, minimum wage. Because today, the de facto, the effective minimum wage is zero, right? If you're willing to work for a dollar or two above zero, and somebody wants you to do their work, then that's the wage you get, not 15. Um, so you've got the gray economy, all of that stuff. Now, imagine you have a job guarantee parallel to all the jobs in the private sector. If somebody from the private sector wants to hire you or you want to go to somewhere in the private sector, they better pay the minimum that you're getting in the job guarantee. So this is very important because then you start thinking, well, what do we consider to be a decent wage? What is the minimum that we think people should earn to survive, right? What is a living wage? And we think that you shouldn't work in you know, earning poverty wages, right? You should probably have some basic benefits, right? um, health benefits, uh, social security, of course, comes with all employment arrangements, and maybe vacation benefit, benefits. So that becomes a package that then has to be met by private employers. I've seen this done uh, in uh, around the country, uh, around the world. I've seen a large-scale employment program like this um, in Argentina, and. When we studied people who moved away from this program into private sector work, 92% of them got jobs at wages higher than what they were getting in the public sector. So we empirically, we know that this does happen. So let me ask you this question. I, I, I would consider myself fairly left. Um, and one of the concerns that people of my ilk have with the job guarantee is that it prevents people from participating in democracy. In other words, let's say there is a righteous protest for the Dakota Access Pipeline. A basic income guarantee would allow them more flexibility in their life, whereas a job guarantee might be more of a quelling of the masses, uh, the proles, so to speak. So how can, how can we address that in a way that allows people, because I, 
I see the way you just presented as the way that we can most likely get to the finish line, given the fact that we are in a pluralistic environment. We don't have the progressive left ruling every aspect of our lives. We've got red, red, red. So can you just address that for, for some of the left? Okay, so here's, here's how I see the job guarantee. Um, first, what are our concerns? Why do we have uh, you know, unrest, social unrest? Some of them are environmental, you know, economic injustice uh, concerns, but some of those economic injustice concerns are directly related to the absence of jobs to the impoverished communities. So the job guarantee doesn't just give you a job, it really tries to lift the community. It really is, is a, as a way to enhance participation. It, it's a participation income. We guarantee you that you will not live in poverty. You got to reciprocate. Come in the community. Let's rebuild this community. And that's what the job guarantee is. Now, if you want to protest the Dakota pipeline, then of course protest, because we, those of us that have jobs, also protest, right? So, there sure. are, you know, that is not the, the current job arrangements do not preclude really um, engagement in other ways. Um, okay, fantastic. Yeah. So. As far as the next year, two, whatever, what are things that progressive activists that focus largely on economics can do to help elevate these concerns to get more of the public understanding? I know that you guys live largely in an academic space. How do us people on the ground make, make these kind of uh, cases to, to people who are not economists? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's probably easier to make the case to people who are not economists because economists have all sorts of excuses why we got to live with some natural unemployment rate. And in fact, we just have to talk to the people and explain what a job guarantee is. I think that there's a lot more support out there, um, certainly in, you know, in our uh, uh, in the United States, where our you know our ethos of work is so strong, there's a lot of support for saying, yeah, you know, we want to show that we are participating, that we are deserving. We don't want handouts. People do not want handouts, even if the programs are there. They, they that are good income support programs. People perceive them as handouts. You know, the, the recipients themselves. They want to be able to show something for them. And so, um, you know, we know that, you know, that these are immensely popular with the people who, who need them. So the, the issue is how we communicate that, that message. Um, and I, I, I feel knocking on doors is, is, is one essential strategy that is a little difficult for academics. Yes. Well, we, <laughs> we, we are going, just so you understand, Real Progressive's number one goal here, and we're starting now, and I'm going to eventually begin eliciting people who are willing to take a step out beyond the, yeah. the, you know, the ivory yeah. tower. Yeah. We are looking at doing a march on April 15th tax day yeah. to unburden the American people yeah. of the notions that have, the myths that have kept them begging for crumbs. And, and this is one of the most important things what you've just laid out to me is it, I want to elevate this. I, I really do. Yeah, I want to say one other strategy, though, um, is talking to your local politicians is essential. This is something that I've been engaged in around the world. Um, now I'm talking to people in Canada who have in, are in government, are in charge of uh, various public programs that are hearing these ideas for the first time, and they are saying, oh, there's, there's something here that we need to do as policymakers at the local level, at the province level. So um, uh, whether it's you know, us academics or activists alike, you, we also have to knock on the doors of the local politicians and say, we want jobs. This is how in Argentina this large-scale, enormous policy was put in place. People went to the streets and they said, we want